Welcome everyone to St. Louis University and to the fourth event of the Religion and Complex Social Issues Series this academic year on the theme of religion, racism, and white supremacy in America. My name is Elizabeth Block. I am a faculty member in SLU's Department of Theological Studies. I am joined by my colleagues, Rachel Lindsay and Emily Dumler winkler We are delighted to have so many people participating tonight, both from our SLU community, as well as from institutions across the country. The Religion and Complex Social Issues series was begun by SLU's Department of Theological Studies in the wake of the deadly white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August, 2017. Eager to condemn the racism of this violent rally and to provide a space for dialogue for members of the SLU community, the department organized its first conversation on racism and God talk in September 2017, out of which this series was born. We have since engaged in numerous topics of importance uh, through the lens of theology and religion, topics including racism, sexism, incarceration, immigration, politics, and law. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by SLU's Department of Theological Studies and the Lived Religion in the Digital Age Project. We wish to thank also the College of Arts and Sciences for the funds to purchase 30 copies of Professor Jennings' book. Although this is the final event of the Religion and Complex Social Issues series for this academic year, Lived Religion in the Digital Age has a couple of upcoming events that you should be aware of. There should be a link posted in the chat momentarily with more information. Um, the second event in Lived Religion Spring 2021 Oratory Speaker Series is in two weeks on Thursday, April 29th with author Tola Rotimi Abraham in conversation with Dr. April Woodson from SLU. This event will focus on religion in Abraham's first novel, Black Sunday. Uh, and now without further ado, I will give it over to Dr. Dumler Winkler who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Block. It's a delight to introduce our featured author and speaker for tonight's webinar. Dr. Willie James Jennings is an associate professor of systematic theology and Africana studies at Yale University's Divinity School. Writing in the areas of liberation, theologies, cultural identities, and anthropology, Jennings has authored several books, more than 40 scholarly essays, and nearly two dozen reviews. Jennings' book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, won the American Academy of Religion Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion in the Constructive Reflective category the year after it was published. And in 2015, the Graumeyer Award in Religion, the largest prize for a theological work in North America. It has justly been called a theological masterpiece. He also published a commentary on the Book of Acts titled Acts, a Commentary, The Revolution of the Intimate, which received the Reference Book of, Book of the Year Award from the Academy of Parish Clergy in 2018. Dr. Jennings has recently published a book, the topic of tonight's webinar entitled After Whiteness, An Education in Belonging. This book keenly examines the problems of theological education and formation within Western education, but it also suggests ways that theological education might begin to cultivate the radical belonging that is at the heart of God's transformative work. The book is remarkable in content and form. It's part memoir, part decolonial analysis, and part poetry, a multimodal discourse that deliberately transgresses boundaries sometimes something that Jennings hopes theological education will do too. Jennings is also an ordained Baptist minister and has served as interim pastor for several churches. So he brings a wealth of experience to our conversation tonight. I know firsthand that he is in high demand as a speaker. I was part of a group that invited him to speak several times before it worked out a few summers ago and it was well worth the wait. So it's a real privilege and a pleasure to get to hear from him tonight and have this conversation with him. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Willie James Jennings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dumler Winker Winkler. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you for this, this very warm 
uh, invitation to come. I'm I am so glad we were able finally to work this out that I could come and spend this time even virtually with you. My friends, I bring you warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty, the staff, and the students of Yale Divinity School. It is a joy for me to be here with you this evening and to have this time to discuss my most recent book, After Whiteness. I have been um, gratified by its wonderful reception with schools and scholars in the US, in England, in Australia, and in Canada. It has been a, a remarkable response so quickly to this text. The central argument of after whiteness is that Western education is plagued by a problem of formation that affects everything we do in our educational endeavors. There is an overarching image of formation, an image of the educated state, what one looks like and acts like when one is educated. And that image is of a white, self-sufficient man who embodies three demonically derived virtues, possession, control, and mastery. That image haunts Western education, bringing a tormenting spirit that pressures, presses, and pulls us to form ourselves into white, self-sufficient men. I have experienced and watched that haunting in my many years in higher education as an academic dean, faculty member, and student, and in my many years as a consultant to schools across the country and in Canada around a whole host of matters, from diversity training to doctoral student formation, from curricular development to conflict management. I've listened carefully as faculty, administrators, staff, and students shared with me their anguish mixed with their joy, their anger and frustration mixed with their determination, their doubting mixed with their commitment, and our shared inability to capture in words something that we all sensed haunted the educational institutions we inhabited. Yet I believe that there is an alternative image that is available to us for the work of building, the work of education. It is an image that we have ignored and banished beyond the walls and work of the academy. That alternative image, that alternative overarching image of who and how one should be as an educated person turns our attention to Jesus and the crowd, that motley, unruly mass of people who are together only because of Jesus. Jesus gathers a crowd. The crowd is not Christian, but it is the basis on which a Christian could form. And it is the basis on which life together, rich life together, could form. Another way to say this is that it is the basis on which communion could form, not just community, but deep and abiding communion. I will explain what I mean by communion in a moment, but this alternative image of formation is cultivating the ability and disposition to gather people together people who would never imagine themselves being together, but here they are together because of you. Whether you are aiming to become a minister or a doctor or a professor or a nurse or an architect or a pharmacist, what you announce by the way you do your work is not a white self-sufficient masculinist intellectual presence that always tries to exhibit possession, control, and mastery, but someone who facilitates the gathering, people coming to know one another 
as they come to know you. How do we uncouple ourselves from that damaging, overarching image of formation and connect ourselves to this life-giving image? It requires all of us, students, teachers, administrators, to rethink our life in the academy, to rethink our life in the academy, and to see clearly the struggle that we all are in the midst of, that is the struggle over and the fight with the image of the white self-sufficient man, or more precisely, the struggle over white self-sufficient masculinist intellectual form. Now, before I go further and we enter into our conversation, I need to say something about whiteness. Because for some people to even say the word whiteness, especially in our moment, already borders on hate speech. But to speak of whiteness is to speak of a historical process of identity reconstruction. Whiteness is not phenotype, not first appearance or biology or culture, and certainly not a part of God's creation. Whiteness is a way of seeing the world and a way of being in the world at the same time. Whiteness is a way of organizing the world, making sense of the world. And whiteness is having the power to order one's world by that effort. Whiteness is an image of aspiration. So when we say a white self-sufficient man, we are not talking about some particular guy of the past or the present, but an invitation offered to everyone, male and female and non-binary person of every ethnic group, social status, class status, nationality, anyone <clears throat> and everyone touched by Western education. It is an invitation to become someone significant by learning to see like the master. You see, it was the master's dream, the modern colonialist master's dream that gave birth to this tragic white self-sufficient masculine image. Self-sufficiency has to do with the legacy of the magnanimous man, the man who, inspired by the logic of Stoicism, lives a balanced life, never giving in to the extremes of gluttony, lust, anger, or emotion. He is one who never apologizes for his strength and his decisiveness, but, is always, but always uses his power for the good. He is one who makes no excuses for weakness. It is this sense of self-sufficiency that shows up throughout the colonial world in the incomidas or the haciendas and especially the plantations of the new worlds. The most important person on the plantation was the master owner. He was what I call the racial paterfamilias. Paterfamilias is a Greek term that refers to the elder father figure who, in ancient Hellenistic societies, was in charge of the household and organized it according to his life, his desires, and of course, his dreams. On the plantations of the colonial world, the father master looked out on his world and asked one crucial question. Who will care for my colonial holdings and my legacy after I am gone? He then looked at his sons with that same question in mind and added a layer to it. Who must my sons become in order to carry forward my holdings and my legacy? and even possibly expand them. His answer, they must become self-sufficient men who embody the three virtues I mentioned earlier, possession, control, and mastery. 
So between the desire of the father master and the aspirations of the master's sons, educational institutions formed and institutions formed. The colonial masters formed education in the new worlds and refashioned education in the old worlds of Europe to answer that question. Modern Western education was formed in plantation desire. The desire of the masters to form their sons to handle power. Indeed, many masters donated the lands and resources that made possible many educational institutions. Many schools exist in the Western world on the land of former plantations. And theological education was central to this desire. Caught between the desires of old masters and the aspirations of young would-be masters, theological education focused its curricular imagination and its teaching energies toward forming elite faith instructors and faith instructors of the elites who could confirm that there were indeed men ready to handle power because each one of them possessed the knowledge necessary to address any task, known or unknown, controlled their own emotions and passions, and knew how to keep control of those under their charge, and had mastered the skills necessary to do those tasks that would translate into continued mastery of their environments and especially the colonial holdings of their fathers and grandfathers. These were men formed to enact their power without apology or pride for the common good. Now, even as society shifted away from legal slavery and unabashed plantation life, the structural reality of Western education remained not only intact, but translatable and translated into every colonial site, embedding itself deeply into the institutional subconscious of the academy, especially the theological academy. So this legacy of dreaming men who attain power and can handle power becomes so compelling and intoxicating for educational institutions and educators, like drug addicts whose ways of being in the world have been contorted by the desire for the drug. Our ways of being in educational institutions have been contorted by the desire to exhibit the control, the possession, and the mastery of this man. How do we begin? How do we begin to overcome this legacy? How do we begin to turn away from this image? My book, After Whiteness, aims at answering those questions through vignette, memoir, poetry, theology, decolonial analysis, I come in through the back door <laughs> and I try to tell the meaning of the secrets, the meaning of the secrets that show the paths that we have taken in the academy that continue to harm us and the paths that are present in and outside the academy that might lead us to our healing and our thriving. So I look forward to talking with you this evening about both these paths. Let me start right there so that we can have as much time as possible for your questions and your comments and we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that um, introduction to your book. I can't speak highly enough about the book, so I encourage everyone to go um, get it and read it for yourselves. I guess an initial question that I would like to ask you to reflect a little bit more on, one that 
I had as I read through the book myself is the relationship, what I find so powerful and compelling about the book, among many other things, is the way in which the book in form actually enacts the very thing that you're talking about. So by weaving together poetry and art and um, example, you tell a number of stories, these, these, the meaning of the secrets, not the secrets themselves. Um, but as you tell all of these things, that's, that's the power. As I started reading the first chapter, I thought I've never read a book quite like this. And it captured my imagination, my attention. Um, and there was so much that resonated and so much that I resonated with as I read it. But it came to me at the end that this is exactly what an example of what you've been telling us to do all along. So can you tell more, can you talk more for those who have not yet read the book about how you decided on that form and why the form is so important for what you're trying to communicate in content? Absolutely, thank you for that question. The, the, the difficulty for those of us who inhabit the academy and even for the students who are coming and being with us for a little while then going on to the, to the rest of their life is that the way we often talk to each other and the ways, ways we inculcate students in that form of speech, oftentimes it makes it far more difficult to get at the complex interweaving of so much especially when you're talking about the water we all swim in. And so part of the goal with this book was to, in a sense, come in through the back door. It, had I tried to do this in straightforward kind of analytic prose that would, would talk about theology and decolonial theory and educational theory, it would have been a huge book and most people would not have read it. More importantly, to, to get at the things that are said off stage, backstage, the things that are said amongst students and faculty and staff, the things that are not for public consumption, you, could, you can't really get at that. And so by coming in through the back door, what I was doing was trying to come inside in a way that people would say, yeah, that's, that's what's going on. <laughs> But at the same time, to, to show and with all that, with, with almost with every page and with every story, to show the path taken and the path left sitting there. And to, um, in that regard, always gesture toward the possibility that was always there. What was that possibility? To start to weave a reality of belonging and to bring belonging back into the heart of intellectual formation instead of banishing it. And in that way, to try to, try to come in through the back door in this regard is to try to slowly pull apart the um, citadel of individualism that is so much a part of how we understand intellectual formation. And so my goal was it was to um, allow people the space to breathe. And poetry helps so much in giving people the space to breathe and to think. And to the other, the other um, important lesson I was trying to present there was what I've learned from so many indigenous peoples that um, the idea that the only way to carry complex, deep thought is in an analytic mode is a terrible mistake. Because for so many indigenous peoples, when you wanna do the serious work, what do you do? You tell stories. Because storytelling is the way the world has carried the deep forward into the deep. Storytelling has been the way to do serious analytical work, serious analysis right at the site of life. And so I wanted to, in a sense, give honor to what I've learned that the, the more serious, the more complex the matter, the more you need a story. 
Thank you. It's a beautiful response. Thanks. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Jennings, about um, the first chapter of the book, the, ch the chapter on fragments. I was really struck by this whole notion of fragments and how you talk about the work of education beginning in the fragments. And it seems like a stark contrast to the self-sufficient white male image that you talk about. Um, and so I wondered again, for those who haven't been able to get through the book yet, um, would you talk a bit about this concept of fragments and, and where you're going with that in the book? Glad to, thank you for that question. So I wanted to start there because this is the place where we first learn to uh, turn away from the truth and to enter into an illusion. The truth is that we work with fragments and the illusion is that we work with holes, W-H-O-L-E-S. But the fragment is so important. And in the book, I talk about three, three realities of fragment that we work with. The first reality of fragment is the, the reality that all knowledge, especially for those within the theological world, we understand this, that all knowledge is in pieces. It's in slices, it's in shards. We, we don't have the full picture of anything. And that's the good thing. And so we're working, trying to weave together fragments. And the goal, the goal there is to recognize that that weaving is gift and that weaving invites us to a shared work, quilt work as I call it there with that first fragment, to think about weaving things together and trying to, trying to recognize that there are some things that we let drop and other things that we pick up. And it is that weaving that orients us first to the work that is a collective work, a shared work. That's the first fragment. And the danger is, is to imagine that we always work with full knowledge, that we always work with a full grasp of everything. And all you have to do is, as I've said to so many people, all you have to do is be a professor or be a teacher for, for one semester and put together a syllabus. <laughs> then you know, you're always working in fragments. You take a piece here, you take a piece there, take a piece here. And you realize that that's good because comprehension is an illusion. Apprehension is a reality because apprehension is this, just this. Comprehension is all of it. So that's the first fragment. But then there's a second fragment. The first fragment is good. The second fragment is tragic. The second fragment is what has been created by the colonial wound, by the the, the shattering, the breaking of so many people's worlds and lives, so many indigenous lives, so many peoples who have felt the reality, the legacy of colonialism. And all those people who are trying to take the fragments that are left and hold them together, and then to weave those fragments of what is left with the fragments that is their education that, that they're experiencing, whether they're in a, a graduate program or undergraduate program, they're trying to weave together those two kinds of fragments. And here, what I wanted to do is to point out the work that all of us educators have often failed at even recognizing, that we are, we are responsible for helping students weave those fragments together, those first two fragments together, trying to make sense of what was left from their peoples, you know, trying to tease out and pull away the derogatory that had been wrapped on this little fragment, trying to um, clean up this fragment that had been buried so long, but not just to, not just to hold it up as, as museum pieces, but for so many students wanting to weave that into the fragments of their education. And so that second fragment is crucial. And then there's a third fragment. And this third fragment is a fragment we resist. Let's call it a form of fragmentation. And the third fragment is the commodification of everything. We who are in the midst of an educational work, we are always, always close to the danger of becoming intellectual merchants, always close to becoming people who traffic in the commodification 
of not only ideas and concepts, but people's lives, their stories, their struggles. We are always on the verge of allowing that capitalist obsession, that capitalist addiction to shape how we do our work. And so we have to resist that third reality of fragment, that fragmentation that is the commodification of the beauty and the complexity of people's lives to take seriously everything that we touch and teach and hold on to as not simply an object to be owned, a commodity to be mastered, but as a life to be respected. And so the work is how do we work with these three fragments? Now, here's what's key. I want all of us involved in education to begin by recognizing ourselves as fragment workers. And in, this, in that first chapter, with those of you who, haven't, who are listening who haven't read it, what I try to do is to contrast being fragment work, workers with thinking of ourselves as people who inhabit particular intellectual traditions. It is, it is fashionable in the last decade or so for people to situate themselves first inside particular intellectual traditions. And I have no problem with the, the work of situating oneself in a tradition. The problem is, is that that work of situating oneself in a tradition often lives in the illusion or should I say, conceals from us this primary reality that we are fragment workers. And so rather than starting by saying what tradition intellectually I'm in or, or theologically I'm in, for those of us in theological uh, um, work, I would prefer us to start to say, what are the fragments? What are the fragments that we're working with? What are the fragments that our students are bringing? And what are the fragments we have to resist? And how do we work with students in this fragment work? And how do we even help students resist the way their own lives have been fragmented? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions from the Q&A that follow on this. I'm gonna to try to smush them together and you can respond um, as, as, as you wish. Um, so Catherine Jones asks, um, I could not help but think about a recent multi-year gener general education reform I helped lead at my college. One great concern among faculty was about the dissolution of the disciplines, but students' mastery of individual discipline, like those in the humanities, would be lost by, say, a new emphasis on interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, or other types of learning. Um, so how does this... Um, how does this fragment work play into the institutional structure of higher ed? And the second question from an anonymous uh, attendee um, asks, how do you recommend students work to shift the narrative of academia while they still have to work within that framework as it exists to get their degrees? Excellent. Let me start with that second question. Let's, let's start with that second question right at the side of the fragment. What I would encourage all students to do, especially students of color, is to, is to bring the fragment work to the faculty, bring the fragment work to the school, bring the fragment work to whatever department that you decided you're gonna major in. Bring that fragment work and say, I need you to work with me about this. I, I, I'm from the Philippines and the Philippines has a long history of colonial occupation. And I'm trying to understand the, the multiple cultural realities of having been raised in the Philippines. What does that, how does that work with this discipline? I'm, I'm here as an anthropology major. What does that mean for you teaching me this discipline? And it's important for students and for, for faculty who understand to say, yes, you are right. Working with the fragments is a part of what it means for me to meet the task of teaching you, of inviting you into this discipline. And so what's really crucial for students to do is the first thing is to put your feet down, open your arms and say, this is who I am. And I require of you, my professors, to join me in this fragment work as I join you 
in that frightening work. Now, the, the question about interdisciplinarity and introducing students to the discipline, I would, you know, I would encourage um, the, the person who asked that question and all the, all the listeners, those watching the Zoom tonight is, to, is my second chapter in which I talk about designs tries to get at this. What, what we have to remember is that um, behind all disciplinary, all disciplinary logics, behind all interdisciplinary logics is the work of design. And it, it is precisely this work of design, how we design educational experiences, how we design learning experiences, how we uh, design and what drives design is what we have to we have to talk about first. And so in the chapter on design, I talk about three realities of design that have to be thought freshly in order to then turn our attention to the configuration of disciplines. The design for attention, the design for affection, and the design for resistance. Now, I don't want to spend the whole time going through the, the intricacies of that chapter, but let me just talk about attention because this ties exactly to um, disciplines. Every discipline that exists is a statement, is a commitment to paying attention in a particular way. And the question every discipline and all those who inhabit a discipline, the question we must ask today in this, in this urgent moment is how has the desire for attention been shaped in this discipline? And most disciplines have a profound colonial imprint in the way in which they have shaped what it means to pay attention. And so what has to happen before we talk about upholding the integrity of a discipline, we have to talk about what, what ways in which, the, what, what are the ways in which the discipline seeks to inculcate paying attention. Paying attention to what and paying attention to who. And how has the discipline been configured to not pay attention to things? That's the beginning of thinking about these matters. In fact, as we know, behind the long quest for more interdisciplinary work has been the desire to expand attention. To, to expand what we see while we stand inside one particular intellectual inquiry. And so that that one particular intellectual inquiry doesn't inculcate students in terrible relent, unrelenting myopia. That they can't see anything else other than what's involved in this discipline. So we have to challenge the myth that the, um, the frontiers of knowledge, uh, uh, touching the frontiers of knowledge require myopia, require narrowness. That's a horrible way to think about what it means to advance knowledge, that you have to ignore everything else, or should I say, continue a legacy of ignoring many things and many people. Thank you for those two responses. Um, I want to raise a question here from the Q&A as well. It's from a student and we often try to start our um, conversation with student questions. Good, good. So this is from Ruth who asks, um, if you could clarify this concept of whiteness. So she says, um, are you saying that whiteness is not a negative thing? Is whiteness a positive trait that encompasses strength and hard work or am I misinterpreting? Or is it indeed something negative that we need to get over in order to heal the church? So could you clarify this concept of whiteness? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so whiteness is a negative thing in, the, in this regard. Now, here is the challenge for so many people. The challenge is that uh, the, the legacy of racial formation in the West is a legacy that has always built visions of the true, the good, the beautiful, the noble, everything positive around whiteness. 
and invited people to aim their life, the fullness of their human existence toward whiteness. So when, when someone has life has been aimed in that direction and they believe that they have entered the arena of that, of that goodness, then to in any way, shape or form, start to call that into question seems incredibly strange. In the long history of racial formation in the West, there has always been two realities of struggle in this regard. There have been those who have been seen outside of the reality of whiteness in blackness or Asianness or you name it. They, they have been colorized, racialized in a different direction. And so what they have done over the many centuries is try to pull themselves who they actually are from the powerful derogatory visions and engines that drive that racial vision, that racial existence. And, and in doing that, they've had to try to pull out, tease out from that derogatory vision, the little slivers and pieces of part truths, distorted truths of, of who they are from that, a work of trying to establish an existential reality apart from that derogatory racial vision. And so, so many peoples are expert at that, having honed it over centuries of trying to pull away, constantly pull away from this derogatory negative vision of their racial, of their existence, this racialized existence. However, if there has been a form of racialized existence that from the beginning was presented as positive, and then people were set on a path to achieve it, to in a sense, um, lock their actual existential reality to it because it's always seen as positive. Then if someone comes along and says, no, it's, it's not positive. And one is then invited to start to pull away from it. This is, this is unheard of. First of all, wh why would I want to do that? Because it's always been presented as positive. And then as I do that, well then, what am I? Who am I? How can I imagine myself apart from this? If the true, the good, the beautiful, the noble, the fully human is always imagined inside of this positive racial existence called whiteness, then why would I want to pull from it? And what would it look like if I pull from it? Well. It requires those who wish to do that to um, learn alongside the many people who have learned how to pull from the derogatory image and to start to carve slowly, ever so slowly, ever so um, carefully, the difference, the existential reality of who they are from this derogatory racial vision. So what am I saying? So whiteness has always been presented as positive. This is why, as I said earlier, when I was giving my opening comments, for some people to even say the word whiteness is already hate speech. Because for some people, they have never in their life imagined who they are apart from whiteness. And so to even begin to think about it seems absurd. It seems like you're, you're telling me to, to, to stop existing. And what you're actually saying is know that there's a reality of existence that is apart from that identity reconstruction that began centuries ago. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Mary Dunn here in our department. She asks, uh, what might academic conferences look like after whiteness? What sorts of presentations or performances or collaborations might we envision? Well, you know, this is, that's an interesting question. And the, the difficulty is that we have to take a step back. Um, academic conferences are embedded all academic conferences are embedded in evaluative ecologies that are sick. And so I talk about this in the book. 
the evaluative ecologies of how one determines, how one determines who should be heard and what should be heard. And that the, the evaluative ecology that has been internalized. And so people are in this, this tormenting reality of self-evaluation that's often activated and strengthened by academic conferences. And so the, the first challenge is to ask ourselves the question, how might academic conferences be used to overturn the sick evaluative ecologies that we have all been deeply embedded in and that have embedded them, embed themselves inside of us that we've internalized? Some of the, some of the most anxiety-filled moments for any academic is going to an academic conference and having to present a paper, having to have someone respond to your work. For some, there, there, there's moments of joy, but for many, that joy is, is completely washed away in the reality of terror and fear and anxiety. And if things don't go well, the profound melancholy that lingers on top of an academic you can see, go to any conference and someone who's given a paper and, and it didn't go well and folks have responded poorly and you know you see them walking on a conference and you would have thought you would have thought that someone tortured them because in point of fact, they have been tortured. And we have told ourselves together that this is for the good of the discipline. This is for the good of our intellectual work. This is for the good of um, pushing knowledge forward. And some of that does happen. But wouldn't it be great if the 10 or 20% of that could be increased in the 80% of the angst and torture and pain that people often feel would be decreased. Like so many people, I know many of us, we go to our academic conferences and we, we go because we wanna hang out with friends, we wanna enjoy good meals, we wanna go get a few new books. And the last thing we want to do is sit up in a room with no windows and watch two scholars go at each other for two and a half hours on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> so what must, what must happen? We have to re-envision the evaluative ecology and then we can start to rethink the conference. Great. Um, this, this question comes from Heather Rubens. She writes, thank you, Dr. Jennings, for this important work. Can you speak to the possibilities for interreligious or multi-religious dimensions in theological formation today? Oh, Could absolutely. you imagine a theological formation in the U.S. not rooted in the logics of Christian supremacy and supersessionism? Well, I, yeah, those are great. That's like three questions, but, I, but they're all yeah. wonderful <laughs> questions. Um, yes. I end the book, if the, the, the person who asked this great question, when they get to the end of the book, tell them to please shoot me an email. I end the book with this wonderful scene of um, uh, uh, some students, myself included, who are part of one of these wonderful interreligious moments of exchange, where it was Christians and, or should I say, um, women and men uh, studying to become pastors and professors, women and men studying to become rabbis, uh, men uh, in the priesthood studying to become priests, and men studying to become imams. And, you know, a few folks who were in training to be, training to be Buddhist monks who were all together on a mountain for, for a retreat. And not, not everybody, not everybody wanted to um, get to know each other, but but many of us did. And we really, we were, to use C.S. Lewis's language, we were surprised by the joy, the joy of being with each other. It's as though we sensed together that there was something beautiful, something wonderful about our, our life together. And so as the, as the conference, as the, as the time ended at this retreat center, and those of us who were really enjoying each other we were there and they were telling us, okay, it's over, you guys, you guys can leave because we have a <laughs> recovery, you can go. We stood there enjoying each other and we th there was something about that 
we could not articulate it, but we knew that there was something about the communion that we were enjoying that was right. And so what I would envision, what I would envision, what would it mean to start an educational process in which your goal is to aim for that, that moment of shared communion? No, and, and, by, and by getting there, it didn't mean that all of us would stop being formed toward the particular religious traditions we were, we were in, but that we knew that those, that formation was also aiming toward that mountain. And so I do think it's possible. And I don't think Christianity has to stay in the trajectory that's formed from colonialism forward. There has always been, even at, even at the height of colonial power, there's always been an alternative witness present of people saying that there's another way. In some ways, I try to perform a little bit of that in the book by, with each little vignette, I try to show that there was a different option possible, but it was not taken. And I learned that by, by looking at what the colonialists did and the moments in which those men and women, they went this direction when another direction was right there possible. And so I do think that there is one that can, that can exist, a form of Christianity that is not supersessionist and not continuing in the legacy of colonialism. And I do believe that there are forms of religious formation that in their best light grasp a reality of communion that can happen for us all together. The next question, thank you again for that. The next question builds, I think on that in a, in a slightly different way. Lori Barron, it comes from Lori Barron who is a professor in the theology department here at SLU. Hmm. And she asks, as a, or says first, as a female professor, I have felt the pressure beginning in graduate school and continuing in the academy to be, quote, one of the boys and to focus on control and mastery, as you describe in the, in the book. Do you have any practical advice on how to resist conforming to whiteness? And her follow-up, or the one that I want to add that she had posed as well, is do you know of any educational systems anywhere else in the world other than the US or European Western context that work well on a very different model than the Western colonialist model? Well, let me start with the second part of that question. Excellent question from, from, from Professor Lori. Um, I'm, I've been hearing from people from everywhere. And the problem is wherever Western education has gone, it has formed this trajectory. And so the good news is that there are people, I'm, I'm meeting people, people are emailing me who are, um, they're clear that, that I've touched the nerve of something that is there. But, and what's great is that they, they all wanna move from it. They want to move away from it. And that is a powerful sign. But, but the problem is, the problem is global in the sense of this formation. I mean, what it means to become a, to get a doctoral degree in almost any part of the world shaped in the Western educational system, you are introduced to this gentleman. He is, you are told that this is who you must become in order to even hear your voice. So let me come to the first then part of, of that wonderful question. How do we resist it? Well, we resist it first by grasping again the desire that brought us into the academy. In the very first chapter of my book, when I, I tell the story of the desire that brought me into the academy. For so many people, it was, it was a desire to escape limitation, escape to escape confinement. And what happened is that my desire that brought me in was intercepted by that man's desire to form me into his image. And I was told by him through his many agents, God bless them all, I was told by him through his agents that the price of the ticket 
to be here is to drop your desire and to pick up mine. And so the first step is to recall, to pull forward, to bring back out in the open, to clean, clarify the desire that brought me here, the desire that brought me, and then to see that desire, to open up that desire, and then to start to ask, how might this desire now begin to help me overturn his desire. Now, we talked about this in, in the book. Uh, I try to um, lay out possibilities of how to start to take this apart, but I've already mentioned something a few moments ago, the evaluative ecology. And so by tapping into that desire, one of the first things we can do is to start to challenge the, the way that form of evaluation has been internalized. The great, um, the great Toni Morrison tells the, that wonderful story very often of um, what she learned from James Baldwin, you know, as she was starting to learn to write. And Baldwin said to her, the first thing you must do is you must take that little white man who sits on your shoulder, <laughs> you must kick him off. <laughs> he's, he's on your shoulder checking out everything you write, telling you what you can write, what you can't write. And the first thing you have to do is you have to push him off your shoulder. It's a beautiful piece of advice. So that there, there is a reality of self-evaluation that we've all had internalized through the master's programs, through the doctoral program, through the seminars, through the, through the exams, through the dissertation. And what we have to do is to start, in a sense, to cast him out. That's where it begins. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you from another colleague in the department, Grant Kaplan, who thanks you for your talk um, and especially loved the poems in your book and wonders if you could translate what he takes to be a very American Protestant narrative. So how do the characteristics of whiteness sound in a Catholic key? Specifically, most theology accredited and done was European and male, but it was also done by supposedly celibate clergy, many of whom took vows of poverty. When did scholasticism come to embody whiteness? And is the transition of theology from overwhelmingly male and clerical to a lay discipline a good development and why? That's an interesting question. Um, I would not narrate it as a, um, as a, a stark difference between the Protestant and the Catholic. Um, the, the evaluative ecology that we're talking about is a colonial. And as colonial, it is, it is shared equally by Catholic and Protestant. And in a sense, you could say that the Catholics help to form it. I talk a bit about this with my, with my uh, Christian imagination text with Jose Acosta, the famed Jesuit uh, scholar, who um, his own uh, way of evaluating the indigenous peoples was so damnable, but so incredibly powerful and so precisely inside a particular uh, Catholic Aristotelian Thomas vision of reality. And so um, it, it really doesn't, it really doesn't modulate from going to Catholic to Protestant. It deepens in a particular way inside um, the way the Protestants understood the relationship between um, the formation of the body and the formation of land and space. But that evaluative ecology is, is very much the same. You know, um, if, if we wanna talk about blame, <laughs> there's, there's plenty for everyone here. But if, we, but if we also wanna talk about the way the trajectory has worked itself back into the formation process. Here, there is not a lot of difference, even at this moment, between Protestant and Catholic. For example, and I, I'm not picking on anyone by giving this example, if you look at the way biblical scholars are formed, if you look at the way biblical scholars are formed, there is not much difference between the formation of a Catholic biblical scholar or Protestant biblical scholar. If you ask what courses they're told to take, if you ask the, the kind of mastery of languages they're supposed to have, if you ask 
the way in which they carry themselves, the way in which they engage in argument discussion, there's not much difference. I, okay, <laughs> make sure you weren't you were finished with that <laughs> with that question. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, um, so the SLU theology faculty have a lot of questions today, <laughs> and I've got one from another colleague, um, Peter Martins. Um, and if um, if I can, I'm going to tack on another question that I have that's related to his. Um, Peter says that much of our work in the humanities involves reading texts. Often we say the goal is to teach students to read critically, to sit in judgment, as it were, over the text. How does your proposal reshape how we read texts? Uh, so that, that's Peter's question. Um, in reading his question, I'm also struck by your image of Jesus and the crowd as being the sort of the, the, the theological paradigm that you want to, um, to engage with and the very enfleshed nature of of that paradigm. Um, so if, if you could just sort of think, uh, maybe, maybe respond to how, does your proposal reshape how we read texts, but also how do non-textual fragments um, enter into this, um, into this work? Well, th these, are, these are both great questions. Um, and I'm gonna repeat something I said earlier, but the, the question about reading text has to be placed inside the question of design. And here's where um, we as academics, we, we often don't think consistently as pedagogues, which is to say the, the, the reading of a text, whether we're talking about the, the more recent tradition of close readings, or if we're talking about longer traditions of, of, um, of memorization, uh, what, what later crudely got called road education, um, no matter what we're talking about in that regard, the, the, the wider question we have to ask is, how are we trying to cultivate paying attention? And here, again, I'm gonna repeat something I said earlier, but I think it's really important. Those of us, I mean, you look, you look behind me, I, I, I love text. <laughs> I, I'm a old, good old fashioned uh, bibliophile, I love books, but the, 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 reality, the reality that I am inside of, especially as a, as a Christian intellectual, is I am inside of the call, the demand from God to attend to the world, to pay attention. And it's that wider reality of learning how to pay attention that has to inform what I imagine myself doing when I teach students how to read closely. And so the question is not what, how would, how would I read text differently because of this? The question is, what does it mean for me to teach anyone how to pay attention? And how do reading texts play a role in that larger work of what it means to pay attention. And I take it, this also ties to the fragment question you're asking because part of the reality is that um, we, we are struggling with this. There are some people who are talking about, well, I want, I want students to learn how to read context as well as, I want, as they read text. I want them to learn how to read you know, their own existence as much as they read. Yes, all that's good. But I, I'm, I want to emphasize the tragedy we're inside of. And here's where those of us who are textualists, we have to understand this. We are inside a legacy of the narrowing of the cultivation of attention. We are inside a legacy that says, attention begins with paying attention to the voices, the thoughts, the writings of the European. We are inside that legacy. And unless we reckon with that, we will constantly push forward that damnable legacy that paying attention to everything else comes secondary to paying attention to these voices and these scholars and these minds. And that has to be reckoned with or all our work about 
close readings will be narrow readings. Thank you. Ruben Rosario Rodriguez, a professor here again in the uh, theology SLU department, um, has a follow up, I believe, to your comment or your response to Professor Laurie's uh, question earlier, you might recall. So he says, in response to your answer, this is great advice about pursuing our own way within the academy, remembering why we came. But we need to be aware that staying true to oneself comes at a cost. And he gives an example. I had a white male dissertation director who eventually allowed me to pursue my own research agenda, but our relationship cooled and he did not advocate for, advocate for me as he did for other students when it was time to enter the job market. Can you talk about some of the costs of um, opting away from whiteness, of choosing after whiteness? This is, this is a great question. So the, 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 the reward and punishment structure of the academy is what is at stake here. And the, the challenge is, is that the reward structure is set up to do exactly what that person you just mentioned did not do, <laughs> follow what his director heard, you know, I'm assuming it was a he, his director wanted. So here's the challenge. How do we, those of us who inhabit the academy, how do we together, again, we want to bring belonging back, how do we together begin to change, shift the evaluative ecology and the reward system set up for that ecology? And one of the places where courage is required is precisely in the formation of doctoral students. This is where the hell begins. And this is where the hell is inculcated into people because they're people who in any other context would be open to the new when it comes to forming doctoral students in many contexts, you can pick, take those same people up and drop them down 50 or 100 years ago, and they'd be saying the exact same thing. So the challenge is that it's a collective, it's a collective willing, a collective thinking, a collective dreaming of a different possibility of formation and a different and to slowly but surely change the reward system so that no one is an island trying to do the new. The new can only be done as a group. The new can only be done as a community. If there's anything we learn from the book of Acts, and we certainly learned that. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Joseph Penny, who is um, a theology student at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, uh, and says, as a Black Costa Rican attending a predominantly white institution, I am often confronted with the tokenization of my life and other Black bodies, specifically in admissions material and classroom discussion. How can I, as a student, confront this commodification of Black life? Excellent question. Excellent question. And my heart goes out to this student, uh, especially if they're alone. Well, the first thing is that if there are others who can join on with you, the, the language we've been using for the last five years, if, if you have allies, it's time to call on them and say, come with me together. We need to talk about this because I've, I'm feeling exploited. And to name it, we learned this a long time ago from so many wonderful womenist scholars. The first thing that you must do is speak the truth. The first thing you must do is speak the reality, not simply of your experience, but of the reality of exploitation. That truth must be spoken and open. And so you begin, you begin by doing that. But then there is, there is the other reality. And these days, many of us uh, are advising students to, to attend to this very carefully. And that is if the situation is toxic and one cannot and one cannot function without feeling the wounds and feeling the wounds growing, 
then it's time to go elsewhere. It's time to go elsewhere. And it's important for students to recognize that you don't have to stay at a place. Even if they've offered you a wonderful package, you can go other places. We would hope that an institution would be open, especially at this moment, to, to recognizing students' cries and students' recognition that they are being exploited. But it begins there. And should the institution listen to you, then the next step is calling upon the institution, not the work you should do as a student, because students should not be doing this work, but calling on the institution to reckon with what your feeling of ex being exploited means for the educational endeavor of the school itself. That's not your work to have the school think through that. They have to think through that. All you must do is to speak what you're experiencing, speak that truth. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions. I'm going to ask another anonymous, um, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, and this, this gets at um, to perhaps some resistance that you've um, encountered um, um, I, I, uh, as, as an advocate for a very transformative um, um, vision of what theological and indeed Western education could be and, and should be. Um, they write, what would you say to someone who believes that the whiteness tradition, this distorted derogatory vision is too deep to remove? It is passed down through generations and is within the very being and fabric of this country and to change the fragments would change the structure of society. What would you say to them and also, what model is opposite this? What virtues, what virtues should we live by if not possession, control, and mastery? Yeah, a great question. Well, theologically, and I say this as a Christian intellectual, as a Christian intellectual, one of, one of the bedrock realities of my intellectual work is the doctrine of creation and the idea that what exists was created out of nothing. Now, I don't want to get into the scientific discussions or the philosophical discussions about that, but let me just bring it bring it to the point why this is so crucial. One of one of the one of the things that's a part of that belief that the that all that exists was created out of nothing is that nothing nothing that exists is eternal. Nothing is permanent. Nothing has a stability that um, is impenetrable. Everything can change. Everything is changeable. And everything, in a sense, does change. It takes incredible energy to sustain anything. It, takes, it is taking incredible energy to sustain the racial condition of the West. And so the question is not, um, you know, why should we uh, deal with it because it's, it's unchangeable? That's not the question. It's not unchangeable. The question is, how do we change the energy that is being constantly expended to sustain the racial condition as it now exists, to sustain the racial status quo, to sustain the geographic racial realities that we are all inside of. Incredible energy is being pressed to sustain it and to give the impression, the illusion that it's permanent. So what is required are for people, people who take seriously the reality that nothing is permanent and that things can change to decide to work together to change what can be changed and everything can be changed. The, 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 the idea of possession, the idea of control, the idea of mastery, all can be changed. In fact, theologically speaking, this is how we understand 
what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, that he inaugurated the new world. That is, what exists is crumbling from within. It's crumbling from inside. And so we are about a crumbling. We're about an overturning. And so, as I say in the, in, um, in the book, and I know this is a complex idea, but it, it's important to hold on to that we are involved in an overturning that is at the same time a building up. An overturning that is also a work of edification. A creating that has within it a, a, a destructive, destroying element of tearing down, but building up as well. And that reality is a fundamental part of being a Christian intellectual and then certainly being a disciple of Jesus, even if one isn't a disciple of Jesus or a Christian intellectual. The point I'm trying to press here is um, the importance of moving away from the illusion that something is permanent, that some structure, some process, or people's ways of thinking are permanent, that they cannot be changed. That is an illusion, a very dangerous one. Because if you believe that something cannot be changed, you have only two options. Either you bow down and worship it, or you kill it. Those are the only two options if you believe that something can't be changed. Because if it can't be changed, it's eternal and godlike. Or it's evil and needs to be destroyed. That's not an option, either socially, theologically, or politically. Thank you. Uh, we, I know we're keeping you up late here. We have a few more questions, if that's okay with that's you. That's fine, that's fine. I enjoy um, it. Okay, good. Uh, so Jason Larson uh, says he's thankful for your work, for this book, and for this event. He writes that in the motions chapter, you write, and he quotes you here, the lie is that in order to know the world, one must know the European world. The truth is that in order to know the world that has come to be, one must know the European world. The calamity is that coming to know the world should never have been put in this way. A powerful quote. He says this, I find this to be the most profound and convincing statement about designing a curriculum that I have read in many years. In conversations about curriculum at my school, 